Luke chapter 12, verse 31. I'll show you some very interesting things here. Luke chapter 12, verse 31 through 40. Now remember the story of the five wise and five foolish virgins as we go through this. They went out to meet the bridegroom, not to marry him, but to meet him. And he comes and, you know, knocks, basically, and they, they come in to the marriage. And those that, you know, had to go buy oil, they come and they knock and they say, open the door. And he says, no, remember that. Luke chapter 12, verse 31. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Little flock? Who does he separate and set on his right hand? The sheep. What do you call a lot of sheep? A flock. Hmm. And what do they go and get? What do they inherit? The kingdom. It's talking about the millennial kingdom here. Verse 33, Sell that ye have, and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Very extremely true for saints in the time of Jacob's trouble. Those Jews are going to have to give up everything, and they're going to be out there in the mountains with no possessions. But what they give up for their earthly life not taking the mark, not going along with the beast system, what they give up there, they'll get it back tenfold, a hundredfold even, you know. They'll get it back, uh, you know, over and over again when they enter into the millennial kingdom. You say, could you give me a type of that in the Bible? Absolutely. Job. Job is a type of the saint in the time of Jacob's trouble that loses everything but gets it all back. And then some. Does even better. But uh, verse 35, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Hmm, lights burning. Kind of like having a lamp that has plenty of oil in it. Huh. Verse 36, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. How can they open unto him immediately? Because their lamps have oil. Their lights are burning. And notice there it says he returns from the wedding. What does that mean? Jesus Christ is going to return from the wedding, the marriage of the Lamb. He returns to the earth from the wedding. See? Jesus Christ is up in heaven and he returns to the earth from the wedding. That's what's going on there. Okay? Verse 37, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Oh, you mean there's a meal when he comes down here to the earth? He comes from the wedding, returns to the earth, then there's a meal, and Jesus Christ actually physically serves these people that made it through the time of Jacob's trouble. Wow. Pretty good honor. You know, pretty good thing to have happen. Yeah. Absolutely. Verse 38. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. It's going to be real difficult for those Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble to keep the faith that Jesus Christ is coming back. Why? Well, because they're probably going to hear the noise of the Antichrist army approaching. You know, I would imagine an army of 200 million men is probably going to make a little bit of a racket. And, you know, you're up there in the mountains, you know, and it'd be like kind of we're here, right here in this valley, and we look over at the top of that ridge over there, you know, up here like that, and we see the Antichrist army coming over the top of the, that ridge. Here comes tanks, and there's a bunch of Apache helicopters and all these things like that, and you're going, oh boy. You know, I don't know if Jesus is actually gonna be coming back here. 
you know, it's going to be real tempting for those people to give up at that point in time. And if they do, when they go join the enemy, they aren't going to make it into the kingdom. Okay, they're going to be foolish, like the foolish virgins that put their light out. They don't say, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, they don't do that. They say, I'm not saved, saved, believing Jesus? No, not me. No, 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 no. I wasn't with those Jews up there in that mountain. No, no, you know, what do I have to do to take the mark and get back into the thing? See, why? Because they gave up. They're foolish virgins. And then if they make it through the thing and they make it into the judgment of the nations and they say, hey, see, we're Jews. Let us into the kingdom. It was promised to our people. Jesus is going to say, no, sorry, I don't know you. You didn't wait. You didn't watch. You quit. Cast them into outer darkness. Very interesting. But now look at Matthew chapter 22. We'll go back there. Matthew chapter 22. Verses 11 through 14. The verses I didn't read before. There's a reason for that. And here again, you see the thing of Jesus Christ coming from the wedding, returning from the wedding, coming down, and these time of Jacob's troubled saints, he comes in and he says, sit down to meet and I'm going to serve you. So that right there is a proof that it's on the earth. The marriage supper is on the earth, not up in heaven. But here's the other one. Matthew chapter 22, verse 11 through 14. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? Question. Who is this friend, this man, that somehow gets into this, you know, the reception basically, you know, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, this guy's in there, this, this friend, and uh, the king comes in and he says, hey, how'd you get in here? And the guy just stands there quiet, doesn't want to say anything. And the Lord says, get that guy, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness. Who is it? Well, I believe for two reasons. I believe that it is Satan. Okay, It's not a whole bunch of people. It's, again, it's in the singular, man and friend. All right? It's... I'm going to show you why I believe it's Satan. Revelation chapter 12. I want you to consider some points here. Revelation chapter 12. I'll show you the first reason why I believe that this quote-unquote friend is Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. Okay, it says here, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Where is the devil right now? You say, in hell. Huh, you know. No, the devil's not down in hell. You say, um, in Washington, D.C.? Well, that might be tempting, but uh, remember Ephesians chapter 6, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. You say, Vatican City? <laughs> well, no, it's not flesh and blood. You know, no, the devil's not here on the earth. Now, the devil can come down to the earth, but he has to report in up there. Okay? Um, that's why the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against a bunch of other things there and spiritual wickedness in 
high places. Satan right now has to report before the throne of God. He's in heaven. Now, think about that. Is he going to be there when we get called up at the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble? Yeah. A lot of Christians don't think about that. They think it's going to be, we'll be getting up there and it's going to be beautiful harp music and wonderful happy joy and stuff and skipping through the field with daisies and flowers and stuff. Uh-uh. No. We're going to get there and we're going to be in the presence of the Lord. And yes, it will be happy. It'll be more joy than you can possibly contain. But the fact of the matter is Satan's going to be there for the first half of the thing. And I've often wondered about that and I thought, wouldn't it be funny if the Lord forced Satan to sit there and watch the judgment seat of Christ happen? <laughs> you know, that'd be kind of interesting. You know, there's the devil over there, grumble, grumble, grumble. Oh, come on, you're crowning that guy. I saw him mess up, I saw him slip up. And the Lord will look over and say, yeah, blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth, cleanseth us from all sin. Sorry. Shut up over there. <laughs> and the devil's sitting over there and he's, he's steaming and getting madder and madder and madder and madder and madder. And finally he's just like, I can't take this anymore. You know, and Michael says, hey, why don't you sit down and shut up? Who are you to tell me that? Oh, you want to start something? <laughs> you know, and Revelation chapter 12. Michael and his angels fight against the devil and his angels. That's also going to be interest, interesting. Not only is the devil going to be up there and he's going to get kicked out of heaven, but he's going to take angels with him. And the Bible talks about the third part of them, you know, like the likens the dragon and he takes the third part of the stars and casts them to the earth. A third of the angels. How many angels are there? I don't know. Probably a lot. That's going to be a lot of angels that leave at that point in time. Well, it's going to be a lot different than most people think. It's going to be a lot stranger than most people think. You know, to get up there and actually see a war in heaven. Judgment seat of Christ, then a war, and then a wedding. Good times. <laughs> Real good times. All right. There's a second reason. So you see there, Satan is on the earth at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why I think he is the man, the friend, that sneaks into the wedding there. But there's a second reason. Okay, Revelation chapter 20. What happened to the, the man that came into the wedding and he didn't have on a wedding garment? What happened to him? The king said, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven come down from heaven, then where would the angel go to? The earth, where the marriage supper is and where the friend is there, the man that sneaks into the thing without a wedding garment on. I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, no question about who this is, and bound him a thousand times years. Grab that man and bind him hand and foot. See how it correlates? See how this is the same thing that's going on here? Verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit, in outer darkness, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. Okay? So right there you see it. I believe that the, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we're going to be down there. The war, battle of Armageddon is over. The tribulation saints are there. We're about ready to, to go into the millennial kingdom. And we have the reception, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Jesus Christ says, I mean, can you imagine what Jesus Christ is going to cook? You know, if he even has to cook, maybe he'll just be like, poof and like this huge table you know all this food and everything else just like you couldn't believe and then you'll see the Lord and he'll be like okay you know put the napkin or the cloth over his thing and come around and say what would you like to order <laughs> you know wow <laughs> it's going to be something else I'm glad I'm going to be part of that I'm not going to be a guest at the wedding I'm going to be one of the members of the bride I'm going to have the 
highest position of honor at that ultimate heavenly eternal marriage. I'm going to be part of the bride. My wife is going to be part of the bride. If you're saved, you're going to be part of the bride. If you missed the rapture and this video survives till then and you're in the time of Jacob's trouble, well, if you do endure to the end, you'll be a guest at the marriage. And you'll be, you know, one of the guests along with all the Old Testament saints. They're not part of the bride. But what about the honeymoon? Look there at Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6. It says here, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the word, or for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Does it say that Jesus went back up? No. You can only be premillennial if you are a Bible believer. There's no other option. Okay, verse 5, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Boy, what a honeymoon. You know? I mean, when you plan to have a honeymoon... You know, what do you do? You don't say, uh, you know, let's head to McDonald's and I'll get you a, a value meal of your choice and, and then we'll, you know, uh, sleep in the back of my car or something. Well, <laughs> maybe some of you did, I don't know. But, you know, you want to go someplace special, don't you? And, you know, I know a buddy of mine, him and his wife went to Scotland. Um, my wife and I went and we rented a cabin in the mountains and real beautiful area and everything, uh, went hiking and stuff. And, uh, you know, you go someplace special is my whole point. My older sister and her husband went to the Bahamas, you know, people go all over the place. Well, that's what we're going to have with Jesus Christ. As his bride, he's going to say to us, well, let's see, you were faithful, you served me with your life, so... And you suffered with me. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him, you know. So, tell you what. I'm going to let you rule uh, this portion of North America. Whatever North America looks like at that point in time. Because all the mountains are laid, you know, flat. Uh, it's going to be pretty interesting coming back to this earth and seeing what it looks like. But the Lord's going to have us ruling and reigning as kings and priests. That's the honeymoon. Okay? And after that is eternity. So it only keeps getting better, you know? I mean, why in the world would you want to miss this, you know, and say, well, I don't think I'm ready to get saved. Well, you're rather stupid, you know? You're rather foolish. Uh, if you want to miss this, you know, that's coming up, I mean, well, if I get saved, I'll lose my job and my friends and my credibility. You're going to lose it anyhow, <laughs> you know? Duh. What do you think is going to happen to you when you die? What do you think is going to happen to you when the, the catching away of the saints happens? You think you're going to keep your job? You know, your friends and your family? No. Hey, over half the world's population is going to be killed at that point in time. What in the world? I mean, hey, you want, you want to have a lot of real estate? You want to have a real big mansion? Wealth, is, or wealth and riches and good health and everything else? You get it in the Millennial Kingdom. But only if you're saved. You know? Only if you've lowered your pride enough to admit to being a sinner and coming to God and saying, God, please save me. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm no good. I know I can never earn my way into heaven. Please, please, I, 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 want, you know, I want to accept the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that blood that he shed on the cross to pay for my sins. That's it. You don't have to drive to some holy city or something like that and kiss a wall or bow down to some statue and say a bunch of dumb things or whatever else. You don't have to make a pilgrimage to some big stupid black stone or something like this. That stuff's all man-made religion. No, all you have to do is one act of faith. Coming to God as a sinner. You know, repentance toward God. No more self-righteousness. No more thinking you're good enough to get into heaven. 
Come to God as a sinner. Ask Him to save you. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross. That's it. You get the whole thing. Member of the Bride of Christ. And if you suffer with Jesus Christ, and if you live as a Christian, you will suffer. You don't have to go out of your way to make yourself suffer. You suffer with Jesus Christ in this life, you come back, and you inherit this whole, this whole thing. Nobody's going to kick you off your land. Nobody's going to come in and, and pull eminent domain on you and take your land from you or something. Or, or you lose your job and can't pay your mortgage or something or can't pay your property tax and your jobs or your place is taken from you. Uh-uh. No. You get the earth as an inheritance, as a member of the bride of Christ. Very interesting. Turn to Romans chapter 16. I like this verse. Or I should say these two verses. Romans chapter 16. You see, uh, one of the most important things that you need if you want to have true love is you need to have true hatred. You can't have true love without true hatred. Now, my true love is the bridegroom, Jesus Christ, the one, the one, who died for me. So then who do I hate? Satan. I hate Satan. And someday, we're going to get the ultimate payback against Satan. See, Satan right now deals in the spirit realm. He's up there, but he can come down here. And he can influence people and, and make people do his bidding. He still has to be under God's control. But the point is, he's up there in the spirit realm, and he can come down here, back and forth. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, he's up there, he gets kicked out. And he's no longer allowed to be there in heaven. And woe to the inhabitants of the earth. If you make it into that time period, the devil comes down and he's got wrath. He's mad at you if you go into that time period. Glad I'm not going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble. But look here in Revelation, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 16, verse 19. He comes... We come down, marriage supper of the Lamb, Satan sneaks in, the Lord says, grab that guy, bind him hand and foot, cast him into outer darkness, down there in the bottomless pit. And what happens to him when he's down there? Verse 19, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men, I am glad therefore on your behalf, but yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. When is Satan bruised under the feet of the body of Christ? Well, during the millennium. You know, it's not going to be that, you know, he comes down, we get there stomping on him and stuff and bruise him. No, you know, he's a spiritual being. Um, what's going to happen is he's going to be down there in the heart of the earth, you know, down the bottomless pit down there grumbling and moaning and groaning for a thousand years. Right now he gets to see all the miraculous, spectacular grandeur of heaven where God dwells. He gets to, to come before God on the throne room and everything else. You talk about high society, you know. And when he comes down here to the earth, well, he goes and he visits with the kings and the, you know, all the rich and wealthy and everything else, you know. And even when he gets kicked out of heaven, he still comes down to the earth and he's got all kinds of good stuff for a few years. But how about during the millennial kingdom? While we're here on the earth, inheriting the earth, and having a good old time up here on the earth, Satan's down there under our feet, you know, and his feelings are hurt, you know. <laughs> he's bruised. He's put down. This uh, anointed cherub that covereth, the one who wanted to be God because he got so proud, and boastful. And where did he end up? In a hole in the middle of the earth, pitch black darkness for a thousand years. Hmm. Kind of like a lot of people. Kind of like a lot of these atheists here on YouTube. A lot of these Muslims and a lot of the Roman Catholics that have no desire for true saving faith. A lot of the Mormons, a lot of the Jehovah's Witnesses, a lot of the religious people. They have pride. And the Bible says that Satan is the king of over, over all the children of pride. Hmm. 
So not only is Satan going to be bruised under our feet, but all the lost world too. They're going to think to themselves, if I would have just taken that tract, if I would have just listened to that crazy, crazy Christian co-worker, that crazy Christian relative of mine. You see, Christian, when you witness for Jesus Christ, you can't lose. When the lost world rejects Jesus Christ, they can't win. Hmm. If they are so prideful that they will not lower themselves, humble themselves enough to get saved, they're going to end up down there, same place as Satan. And at the great white throne judgment, they're going to get to go and be cast in the lake of fire forever. Forever, by the way, too. Don't believe this nonsense that... Uh, Oh, well, you know, hell's just uh, annihilation or some other wicked nonsense. That stuff's increasing and increasing, and it comes from people that are going there. But to turn, last of all, to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Okay, Revelation 22, verse 17. And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. You know, sanctify them by the washing of water by the Word. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, lowercase w. What's the water of life? I believe it's the book. Right here. King James Bible. You want to get saved, believe on Jesus Christ that appears in this book. You want to go to hell, believe anything else. Believe in yourself, believe in good works, believe in Muhammad or anything, any other pagan. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I uh, anxiously await this time when we will be able to go and finally be joined to you and, and never leave your side, uh, when we won't have to worry about sinning anymore, we won't have to worry about being in this corrupt, wicked world. But Lord, I know sometimes we can get distracted from the work that we have to do for you. And so Lord, I just pray for all the Christians out there that are hearing my voice, that they would stay fervent in the things of the Lord that they would stay in the, in the pages of the King James Bible, that they would listen to the old hymns, Lord, that bring honor and glory to thy name and to thy word, that they would stay busy about witnessing for thee, that they would stay true to your word, that they would not fall away and stop looking for your coming and listen to all these liars out there that are telling them that they're going to have to go into the time of Jacob's trouble when your word is so very, very clear that they do not. The body of Christ, it leaves before that. But by getting people sidetracked, they start to prepare to go through the time of Jacob's trouble instead of preparing to meet you face to face. So Lord, I just pray for all those people out there. Um, I just, I pray, Lord, for those who have recently been saved. I pray that they would stay in your word, that they would, uh, that your Holy Spirit would protect them in this very evil time of apostasy and wickedness. Um, it's just incredible, Lord, how many wicked movements are out there. So I just ask, Lord, that you would please uh, protect all of your, of your saints out there until you take us away. And I pray, Lord, that this time would not be too far off. I know I'm really looking forward to meeting a lot of the members of the body of Christ out there. I'm just anxiously awaiting this time, Lord. And I just... Uh, Pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it. Uh, just a prayer request here. Um, 
not going to give any names or anything, but recently had a, a young sister um, become a sister, <laughs> and uh, she got saved, and uh, she is a former Roman Catholic, and I'm just, you know, she's going to have her family to deal with, and she's got a lot of obstacles ahead of her, so if you could just please pray for her. Um, I can't. I don't want to give the name out or anything else, but uh, I've been in contact with her. Um, I know it's very difficult uh, to come out of of a religious tradition like Catholicism or Judaism or Islam or some of these, and come out of that thing, or branches of Protestantism, you know, like Lutheranism. I know my wife had a hard time uh, with that. I won't say more on that, but I know it's very difficult to get saved and to have to deal with family members that are still lost. And so this, you know, young woman, uh, she's going to have a hard time. And so I'm just praying that, uh, you know, everybody out there can just pray for her. Uh, the Lord knows who she is and just pray that the Lord protects her in this very important time uh, as a new convert. And uh, she expressed to me that her mother is not saved. Um, the very devout Roman Catholics. So I'm just praying for her salvation as well. Uh, I pray that the Holy Spirit would prepare her heart to hear what her daughter has to say or, you know, whatever there. And, and I just really, really am putting uh, a request out there to all you that watch this channel. Please pray for her. Uh, just bring her before the throne and just pray for the Lord's protection. So that's going to be it. Uh, we have a real big study coming up here. It's going to be a multi-part sermon on the history of Baptist church buildings. And we're finding out some very interesting things. And uh, it's going to be made as a strong rebuke, but also in a spirit of love and truth uh, for the brethren that are out there in these Baptist church buildings, these independent fundamental Baptist churches. I'm not going to say a whole lot more on that, but uh, we're finding out some things, some very interesting things. And uh, as time goes by, I think you're going to see more and more persecution coming to people who are, who are worshiping in these buildings. And that's why I'm making this sermon. I'm not trying to sow seeds of division. I'm not trying to make anybody mad on purpose. Um, but I'm just trying to bring people back to the book. If you know nothing else, if you learn nothing else from this ministry, learn this. This is the standard. King James Bible. Okay? Not me. Not my opinions. Not my interpretations thereof. The book. I turn people to the Bible. Not to creeds. Not to confessions. Not to catechisms. Not to holy books. Not to devotional books or whatever. Greek or Hebrew. You know. King James Bible. This is the standard that you'll find here on this channel. And I've been rebuked many times, by the way, by some of the brethren. They tell me I'm wrong according to Scripture, and they show me verses. A lot of times I just say, no, I'm sorry. You know, you didn't prove your point. But there have been times I have been proven wrong. And I am not too prideful to admit that. Uh, there have been times I've had to go back and redo things and apologize for things I've said previously. And uh, I am open to rebuke. But you better make your rebuke, rebuke in line with this book. Because otherwise, I could care less about your feelings. Okay? And I don't say that from a spirit of being nasty or something. I say it from a spirit of love. Okay? I can't submit myself to people's feelings and emotions. Okay? I'm a logical man. Logic versus emotion. You can watch that sermon. All right? So that's going to be it. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be coming out with these sermons probably in the next week or two. Uh, we'll let you know. Uh, just keep watching keep praying for the for the ministry here um, I apologize for being kind of scatterbrained today but I had a real rough uh, night sick for most of the day and just I'm tired right now so <laughs> please forgive me for being a little bit uh, off today but uh, that's gonna be it thank you very much for watching